Okay, well, thanks a lot. And I'm really excited to talk about some um, brand new results out of our lab um, that have come out of an idea I've had for the better part of a decade, but uh, my postdoc, uh, Perry Wood, and I have really been working on over the past few years. And these are really fresh results. So if I lose, if I lose anybody along the way, just stop me with questions. I won't try to keep an eye on the chat window, but just shout out if you have a question. Um, if you want a copy of these slides. I could also read them. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, if you want these slides, you should be able to scan this QR code to, to get the PDF of these slides. All right. So um, yeah, so this idea that I've had for a while, um, let's start with an assumption. It's really where it, uh, the idea is really born out of. So when we uh, go out and we collect data from our favorite group of critters and we want to infer a sort of rooted time proportional or time absolute tree from them, when we do that inference, we're making an assumption that the divergences in that tree are independent and strictly bifurcating. So what do I mean by that? So if we look at sort of this ancestral uh, lizard that was evolving here, when it sort of hits this magic moment when it diverged, whatever process caused it to diverge only leads to two daughter species and has no effect on any other um, lineages across the tree. Okay. So that's an assumption we're making. And there's a lot of reasons why we might expect that assumption uh, to be violated. Uh, so I'll show you sort of a biogeographic example. So let's say we have three species of lizards um, on this island here. And at some point, uh, sea levels rise and they fragment this island into, into two islands. That might cause um, all three of our species to diverge at the same time, right? So that's violating that independence assumption. Um, and you know, if sea levels continue to rise um, and fragments the larger island further into two, two islands, we might get another bout of divergences, um, again, violating that independence assumption. Um, you can also imagine that if, um, if all three islands uh, fragmented, at the, fragmented at the same time, we might expect to see uh, multifurcations in the tree, another assumption that we're making um, that would be violated with this example. So that's an example from biogeography, but there's other fields of biology where this is relevant as well. So if we're interested in the uh, evolutionary history of gene families, any sort of duplication where um, a region of a chromosome that has multiple members of that gene family gets duplicated, that's gonna cause um, sort of co-divergences or shared divergences across the phylogenetic history of that gene family. Um, what a lot of people are, probably is fresh to mind right now is epidemiology. Um, for example, if you um, sort of, um, mass transmission of a pathogen at a social event, you know, everybody sort of brings their evolving lineage of the pathogen to the party and they're going to diverge um, at that gathering. So again, sort of violating that independence assumption across the tree. Um, and really any sort of situation where we have organisms living on or inside other organisms sort of creates the possibility of um, violating the assumption of independent divergences. Okay, so why, do, why should we care? So why should we care about um, this violation and trying to actually account for shared divergences across the tree? Well, one reason is we might stand to improve phylogenetic inference. So um, for example, let's say that this was the true history for these nine species of lizards. And so essentially their diversity can be explained by three events, but currently we're using a model um, that tries to explain those three events with eight parameters, right? The number of tips minus one divergence time parameters. So that's over parameterized and might be introducing unnecessary error into our analysis. So we could improve inference by um, accounting for that. Uh, but what I'm really more excited about is another reason and that's to provide a statistical framework we're actually testing the uh, patterns predicted by these processes. So back to this slide, as a biologist, these, I find these processes very interesting and I would like a way to be able to test the patterns they predict, right? So that's another reason why for the counting for shared divergences could be intriguing. Okay, so how am I gonna go about uh, doing this? Um, and so the approach that I'm gonna take is try to generalize the space of trees that we consider during phylogenetic inference. So currently, 
we only consider a class of models that has the number of tips minus one divergence time parameters. So with four um, species, um, there are 15 possible topologies um, with three divergence time parameters. Okay, so I'm showing you the, the unlabeled trees because I can't fit all of these on the slide, but um, there are 15 leaf rooted leaf labeled topologies for um, four species. Um, and I just want to point out that these are not labeled histories. Um, so the internal nodes are not labeled. So we don't care about the order uh, of the divergences. I just had to pick a way to draw. Um, okay, so this is sort of the, 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 the universe of trees that we currently consider during phylogenetic inference. Um, but there are other classes of trees nested within uh, this class uh, with fewer divergence line parameters. And so I'm showing all of those here. So we can go to the extreme where there's only one divergence line parameter and we sort of have our, our cone tree here. Um, but then there's, uh, there's also a class of trees with two divergence line parameters. And so what we wanna do is, is, is actually consider the full space of topologies during inference. Um, so, you know, barring no reticulation, all strictly um, diverging topologies. Um, and so this is similar to work that was done uh, by Paul Lewis and colleagues, but we're doing it in a, they did it, they allowed for polytomies for unrooted trees. So we're doing rooted trees, allowing polytomies and also allowing for sort of shared divergence times uh, across the tree. Okay, so um, how are we gonna do this? Well, we first need to specify a distribution over this space. Uh, and we're gonna do this in a Bayesian context. So we really need a coherent uh, distribution over this generalized tree space. Oh, and one thing that I do wanna point out is I'm saying, I'm using the word generalizing, even though that the sort of new topologies we're allowing on the playing field during phylogenetic inferences, during, during inference are actually special cases of the class of models that we currently um, are considering. So um, that might, I don't know if generalizing is the best term there, but a real statistician can, can tell me a better term if that's, if, that's, um, if that's not correct. So we're sort of generalizing the space, but the, but the new models we're allowing in are actually special cases of the most general model that we're currently considering. Okay, so we need a coherent distribution over this space. And so um, what we chose to do is just to treat all topologies um, so all the topologies are equally probable a priori. And so we go back a slide. So here, sort of all 29 of these um, leaf labeled rooted trees are equally probable. Um, we specify some parametric distribution on the age of the root. And then we have sort of beta distributions sort of down the tree on uh, other um, divergence times. And these, these beta distributions are distributed between um, the present or time zero and the most, uh, the youngest parent uh, of a node that's currently sort of assigned to that divergence time. This is very similar to Kishino et al's um, sort of Dirichlet prior on, on divergence times, but I had to sort of break it up into separate betas because of these shared divergence times. So it's a little bit different, but it's, it's similar in spirit. Okay, so that's the distribution we're gonna use on this space. Now we need a means of sampling that distribution. So we're gonna take a Bayesian approach to this. And since we're gonna be sampling over models of different divergence times, we're gonna use reversible jump, Markov chain, Monte Carlo. And so just very briefly, um, we need a way of being able to split up shared divergence times and multiplications and merge them back together. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm just gonna say it's, it's, it's magic, right? <laughs> Not gonna get into the details here, but I will show you that um, we did validate that our algorithms are um, sampling the space correctly. So I'll do that with a test that we did with a seven leaf tree. <clears throat> and with seven leaves, there are about 128,000 uh, topologies, that generalized space of topologies. And if our um, samplers are working correctly, we should sample all of these trees um, with equal frequency. And so if we look at the counts of how many times we sample the trees, that should be uh, approximately binomial, just binomially distributed. Um, and and as, as we can see here, um, the dotted line is showing us the expectation and the solid line is showing us what we're actually getting with our algorithm. So we're spot on. We can't reject that we're sampling from the expected distribution with a chi-square goodness of uh, fit test. 
And so things look good. And we've done other, other validations, making sure the divergence times are being sampled from their expected distributions as well. Okay, so this is all implemented in a new tool called uh, Phi Coeval. This is part of the EcoEvality package. Uh, so just very briefly, um, we're going to assume a continuous time Markov chain model of characters evolving along genealogies. And then we're going to take advantage of some really nice work from David uh, Bryant and colleagues, um, where we can analytically integrate over coalescent genealogies and sort of directly estimate the species tree from the character data. Um, but I do want to point out that I'm, I, I'm coming at this from a biogeographic perspective, and so that sort of likelihood model makes sense. But this distribution, this generalized distribution, and the algorithms to sample it are completely, completely agnostic to the likelihood model. And so this is the model that I'm using, but this is, this is really general. We can sort of plug and play with any sort of likelihood model on phylogenetic trees. And of course, we have our re reversible jump machinery to sample this space. So really, the goal here is sort of to be able to co-infer the phylogeny multifurcations and shared divergence times all at the same time from genomic data. Okay, so first thing to do is to simulate some data and see if, um, if the method is working. Um, so we simulated 100 data sets on this tree here um, with each data set has 50,000 characters. Um, keeping it simple, so we're assuming a strict clock and we're assuming one shared effective population size applied to every branch on the tree. So there's just one population size. So we simulated 100 data sets on this tree, and then also on this um, independent, strictly bifurcating uh, tree here, with some pretty close divergence times, seeing if we can sort of trick the new method into lumping um, uh, uh, divergences together. Um, and then also, we did 200 additional simulations where we are allowing the tree to vary and be sampled from the, from the prior distribution. Uh, both the bi strictly bifurcating prior distribution and the generalized distribution. Okay, so let's look at some results here. So this is the tree we used for simulations, and I'm just going to show here a histogram of the posterior probabilities for some of the features on this tree. Um, so I'm showing you the post the histogram of the posterior probabilities of the multifurcations. And so these aren't split posterior probabilities that we're used to in phylogenetics. This is actually, you know, what's the probability that we have a node with you know, these three um, uh, splits descending from. So it's really the node uh, probabilities. So we're seeing very good high posterior probabilities across all the simulations for our polytomies and for actually inferring these shared divergences. And so this is, this, what this is showing up here is what's the posterior probability of correctly inferring these shared divergence times exactly, right? So these exact nodes sharing this, this time. Okay, so it looks like it's working pretty well with this tree. Um, let's look at this a little bit further. So let's add some labels to the internal nodes so that we can look at sort of how often do we sort of incorrectly split up this polytomy. Okay, so let's look at this, this polytomy here. And I'm going to be um, using this um, color scheme. So results. Um, that were analyzed under the new methods or the generalized distribution method will be in blue. And um, when the data sets are analyzed under sort of the, the current sort of uh, independent strictly bifurcating model will be shown in orange. So what we can see is we are much less likely to have spurious support for um, um, resolutions of a polytomy um, than um, the, the bifurcating model. So that looks good, right? We're not being, we're not overconfident in resolving, in, in, no, but not overconfident in, in branches that don't exist in the tree. And this is just gonna show that same plot for this other polytomy. So once again, we're not finding strong support for a branch that doesn't exist here, but the bifurcating model can often find um, quite high support for it. And so the new method is, is just not tricked into sort of spuriously supporting non-existing branches. Which is good. Okay, so now let's look at some results when we are um, simulating data on this tree, sort of the independent bifurcating tree. Well, both methods do great. So this is actually the posterior probability of the whole topology, right? So this isn't looking at any particular feature in it. It's the whole posterior probability of the whole tree. We're essentially always fully confident in the right answer with 
with both approaches. And this is just showing, you know, possible ways that the new method could be fooled by lumping some of these times together, but it's it's not being fooled, right? It's it's showing no support for those those incorrect um, arrangements. So that looks good. Okay, so another way of looking at this is by looking at sort of what's the sort of distance from the true tree. And so we sort of use the square root of the sum of squared um, differences in branch lengths that um, Kuhner and Felsenstein came up with. Um, and so when we're simulating data on this tree, um, we are doing a much better job when we are using the new method um, than using a, an independent bifurcating model. And that's very, um, we can do a, uh, sort of paired non-parametric t-test and get strong support that we're that we're doing better. Okay, so but importantly, when that's not the case, when we simulate um, data on an independent bifurcating tree, we so we see no um, detriment to using the new method, which sort of makes sense because all of the um, all uh, all of the models that we're exploring with the new method are nested within this model. So if all is going well, we should be able to do as well as, as sort of current um, methods. And we do. So we, um, there's no difference between the performance of the new method with the bifurcating method, if that's the correct model. OK, and just really quickly here, um, we've seen from a couple of cases, um, what appears to be generally true is we're getting better convergence and mixing under uh, by allowing this sort of searching this new by searching this new tree space, we're getting better MCMC -MC behavior, um, which is kind of surprising to me and, um, and kind of cool. Okay, so when we allow the tree and the branch lengths to vary in the simulations, um, we're doing a really good job of estimating the true tree length and the true population size, and we're getting our expected coverage. So we're, we're covering the 95% confidence intervals covering the truth 95% of the time about, so that's great. Good sanity check there that things are working. Um, and whenever there is a true shared divergence time, we're getting quite high posterior probabilities for um, those events. So that's that's good as well. So the, the, um, the good behavior is not restricted to just those um, the trees that I chose to simulate data on. Okay, so it's doing well on random trees as well. Okay, very briefly, we applied this to um, some lizards from the Philippine Islands. And these islands have been fused together and fragmented repeatedly over the past four to five million years. And so we really want to get at this question, did the fragmentation of these islands drive diversification? And if you want to see an animation of this, um, you can go ahead and scan that QR code. Um, but I'm going to keep going, so because we're running out of time. OK, so we collected some genomic data from 26, 27 and 26 um, populations of two different genera of geckos from across the Philippines. Um, and yeah, so we've got a, you know, between 1,000 and 2,000 loci, um, about 100 to 150,000 sites. So moderately sized genomic data sets from um, these, these two different groups of lizards. And we're finding shared divergences. Um, so this is Certidactylus, the bento geckos. We're finding um, some moderate support for shared divergences in about the time period that these islands are being fragmented. But it's also the time period where we have the most divergences happening. So it, you know, we have to take account for that in, in sort of assessing the um, significance of these results. But still, um, um, pretty cool um, results here. And these are very new and totally thanks to my uh, postdoc um, for getting these data together in time for this talk. <laughs> All right, and this is just showing a distribution of the number of divergence times. So we're not getting, we're not sampling anything over um, 21 divergence times and the maximum is 26 in this case. So we're really excluding um, sort of the current model of, of independent divergences. Uh, and this is just showing, showing the um, other uh, genera, other genus of geckos. Once again, we're finding shared divergences in polytomies. And once again, we're sort of excluding anything, you know, 21 to 25 divergence times. Uh, we're sort of excluding the current model of, of independent divergences. Okay, so very quickly, take home points. Um, we, we seem to be able to accurately infer shared divergence times and multiplications from moderately sized genomic data sets. Um, and generalizing this space has other benefits. To, it seems to improve MCMC -MC behavior. Um, and we are finding support for shared divergences that are predicted by island fragment fragmentation in the Philippine Gaconic lizards. 
And there's just so much more to do. So if you're interested in this, definitely let me know. There's plenty of theory and algorithm work to do. Um, this needs to be ported to better software where there's other likelihood models that this, this new distribution can be coupled with, especially paleogeographically explicit range evolution models. Um, that would be really cool to couple this with because then we could actually look at sort of the range evolution you know, on these sort of shared divergences and see if they make ge um, geological sense. Um, and really process-based priors on that tree space would be would be really a um, good thing to do as well. So we can actually learn about macro evolution during the inference. Um, like everything I do, everything's up on GitHub. Uh, so the new method, the simulations, and the Gaconid work. Um, and lots of people to thank. Um, NSF uh, funded all of this. Um, and, you know, I have a great group of people here at Auburn um, that helped along the way as well. And thanks to all the organizers of the meeting. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions.